to the front. <laughs> it's awfully close to us, but I promise we won't splash you. Literally. <laughs> <laughs> Scott Prostoski, are you in the house? Scott, there you are. Just making sure I've got my reader. <laughs> okay. Can I can I see the reading, please? Because I don't think I got it in the mail. It's in the book. Welcome to worship on this day, sixth Sunday of Easter. Can we ask for a more beautiful day? <laughs> yes, I know. Friday, I was a little nervous. Thursday or Friday? Yeah, Friday. Thir Thursday, I was a little nervous. I'm like, ah, uh, I don't know. But God came through. Thank you, Lord. As we uh, come together today, we've got uh, we're finishing out our uh, time in John chapter 16. Uh, closing it with the actual closing verses of it uh, and we have uh, the promise uh, yet again of uh, sufferings yay <laughs> and conquering yay oh, yeah. sufferings and conquering it's going to be a wonderful text to look at some wonderful promises uh, to behold uh, let's stand up and let us join in our opening song. Everything you need is in your bulletin. Lyrics for all the songs are in there. Let's stand and uh, begin our service now. Praise to the Lord, the Almighty, the King of creation. Praise to the 
In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Holy is the Lord, the Almighty. Who was, and is, and is to come. He is worthy of glory, and honor, and power. He created all things, by his will they came to be. Worthy is Christ, the Lamb, who was slain. Worthy to take the scroll and break its seals. By his blood he purchased for God people of every race and tongue, of every fold and nation. Christ made of them a kingdom and priests to serve our God, and they shall reign on earth forever. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. O God, from whom all good things do come, grant to us, your humble servants, that by your holy inspiration we would think those things that are right, and by your merciful guiding would do the same. Through your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, world without end. Amen. You may be seated. Testing. 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 The first reading is from Numbers, chapter 21, verses 4 through 9. From Mount Hor they set out by the way to the Red Sea to go around the land of Edom, but the people became impatient on the way. The people spoke against God and against Moses, Why have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? For there is no food and no water, and we detest this miserable food. Then the Lord sent poisonous serpents among the people, and they bit the people, so that many Israelites died. The people came to Moses and said, We have sinned by speaking against the Lord and against you. Pray to the Lord to take away the serpents from us. So Moses prayed for the people, and the Lord said to Moses, Make a poisonous serpent and set it out on a pole. And everyone who is bitten shall look at it and live. So Moses made a serpent of bronze and put it upon a pole. And whenever a serpent bit anyone, that person would look at the serpent of bronze and live. The second reading is from James chapter 1 verses 22 through 27. But be doers of the word and not merely hearers who deceive themselves. For if any are hearers of the word and not doers, they are like those who look at themselves in a mirror. For they look at themselves and, on going away, immediately forget what they were like. But those who look into the perfect law, the law of liberty, and persevere, being not hearers who forget, but doers who act, they will be blessed in their doing. If any think they are religious and do not bridle their tongues, but deceive their hearts, their religion is worthless. Religion that is pure and undefiled before God, the Father, is this, to care for orphans and widows in their distress, and to keep oneself unsustained by the world. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please stand for the reading of the gospel. The Holy Gospel for the sixth Sunday of Easter comes from St. John, the 16th chapter, beginning at the 23rd verse. Jesus said, On that day you will ask nothing of me. Very truly I tell you, if you ask anything of the Father in my name, he will give it to you. Until now you have not asked for anything in my name. Ask and you shall receive, so that your joy may be complete. I have said these things to you in figures of speech. The hour is coming when I will no longer speak to you in figures, but will tell you plainly of the Father. On that day, you will ask in my name. I do not say that you will ask the Father on your uh, that I will ask the Father on your behalf, for the Father Himself loves you, because you have loved me and have believed that I came from God. I came from the Father and have come into the world. Again, I am leaving the world. And I am going to the Father. His disciples said, Yes, now you're speaking plainly, not in figures of speech. Now we know that you know all things and do not need to have anyone question you. By this we believe that you came from God. 
Jesus answered them, Do you now believe? The hour is coming indeed, has come, when you'll be scattered, each one to his own home, and you'll leave me alone. Yet I am not alone, because the Father is with me. I've said this to you, so that in me you may have peace. In the world you face persecution, but take courage. I have conquered the world. This is the Gospel of our Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. You may be seated. <laughs> Love the Lord, grace and peace with you from God the Father and from His Son, Jesus the Christ. Amen. If you ask the Father in my name, He will give it to you the passage which is the reason for which all prayers end in Jesus' name. Because if we pray our prayers in Jesus' name, then we are certain to get what we prayed for, correct? Except there's all sorts of prayers that we prayed attaching in Jesus' name and didn't quite go the way we anticipated, right? (laughs) The way we expected it to go, the way we asked for it to go. The cancer didn't go away, the loved ones still perished, the marriage still unraveled, the abuse of the spouse did not let up, the overwhelming urges of another drink or another hit didn't go away, the company decided to go with somebody else, and so on, and so on, and so forth. So did Jesus make a false promise? Did he not actually mean what he said? And if he didn't mean what he said, what other promises did he make that he also did not mean to make? Or is my faith too small? Maybe if I just had a little more faith, right? Maybe if I just had a little more faith, then my uh, my prayer would come to fruition. If only I believed a little more, believed a little harder, if only I had more faith, perhaps my prayer would have come true, as though it somehow depends on you and your works. Or perhaps, perhaps, I misunderstood this passage all the while. Perhaps I wasn't properly taught what it means to actually pray in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name is not a magical incantation. It's not the magician's abracadabra that brings to fruition the deepest desires of your heart. Just add in Jesus' name and poof, your illness is gone. Poof, you feel like a kid again. Poof, the marital problems disappear. So what does it mean to pray in Jesus' name? Until now, he says, you have not actually asked for anything in my name. Ask and you will receive that your joy may be complete. It's kind of hard to believe that after three years of following Jesus, that the disciples would not have asked for anything in Jesus' name. Can you believe that? Especially when Jesus himself taught them how to pray. He bid them to pray. And not only did he do this, he actually taught them how to pray. And not only did he teach them how to pray, he also gave them the words to pray, right? Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, and so on. So what's going on here? To pray in Jesus' name is not simply throwing or attaching Jesus' name to your prayer but it is to pray in the authority of, the power of, and most especially according to the will of Jesus. How do you know then if your prayer is in line with the will of Jesus? Well, let's take a little mental inventory. First, does my prayer line up with the commandments? Do they line up with the commandments of God both according to the letter of the law and according to the spirit of the law? Second, is my prayer in line with the prayer that Jesus told me to pray? The nature of this particular teaching on prayer in our text is such that you are already praying to our Father in heaven, right? Because he says if you ask anything of the Father. So you're off to a great start. Okay, you're off to a great start. You're praying to the Father. So you want to especially pray then, uh, especially pay attention to the chief petitions of the Lord's Prayer, especially these petitions. Hallowed be thy name, 
thy will be done. Um, and also, um, deliver us from evil. Whose name, first of all, whose name is looking to be hallowed in this prayer? Are you looking for your name to be hallowed? Or are you looking for God's name to be hallowed? And this, of course, correlates to the first and second commandments. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt. You shall, no, shall have no other gods before me. And you shall not take the Lord's name in vain. Which means in part that you shall not call upon or use the Lord's name superstitiously. The Lord's name shall not be abracadabra to you. <laughs> so whose name is looking to be hallowed and along with it, who is God in this prayer? Thy will be done. Goes right along with that question of whose name is looking to be hallowed and who God is biggest act of faith is to pray, Thy will be done. Because if we play it out with inevitable fullness, it sounds like Jesus when he prayed in the Garden of Gethsemane. Right? Father, if it's possible, remove this cup from me, but not my will. Not my will. But thy will be done. Is what you're asking for in accordance with the will of God. And deliver us from evil, or more pro properly, deliver us from the evil one. Is what you're praying for going to bring about the deliverance that you're looking and hoping for, or might it bring about further prolonged sufferings? Will it beget further evils? And from a finite human perspective, I'm not too sure that this is a question we can really ever know. We have very limited scope, especially where the future is concerned. And then lastly, after this uh, inventory has been taken, can you wait on the Lord? Can you wait on Him? As the psalmist say over and over again, wait on the Lord. I wait on the Lord, and in His word, I hope. Remember, I can't help but think of uh, where we were uh, when we started this uh, passage, uh, this uh, in, uh, the study of chapter 16. Jesus promised his disciples, "Truly, truly, I tell you, you will weep and you will mourn, and the world, uh, excuse me, you will weep and mourn, but the world will rejoice. You will have pain, but your pain will turn into joy." And he likened that weeping to the, uh, and that pain to the most excruciating of pains of a woman in labor. Can you wait on the Lord even in that? Can you bear a cross trusting and knowing that you do not bear it alone, but that Christ himself has already bore it for you? For decades upon decades, the Hebrews called out to God for a deliverance when they were slaves in Egypt. And long after they figured that God had all but forgotten of them, the Lord appears to Moses and says, Guess what? The prayers of my people have come before me. And I send you to deliver them. And for about 40 years, the Jews were in captivity in Babylon before God finally raised up a deliverer in the person of Cyrus of Persia, sending, allowing those who desire to return to the promised land. Very often times, seems and feels like God is a slow mover. <laughs> Does he not? And he is. He is a slow mover. I'm reminded of the words, though, of Jeremiah in our reading from Lamentation two weeks ago. It is good that one should wait quietly for the salvation of the Lord. It is good for one to bear the yoke, to sit alone in silence when the Lord has imposed it, to put one's mouth to the dust. There may yet be hope. To give one's cheek to the smiter, to be filled with insults, for the Lord will not reject forever. Although he causes grief, he will have compassion according to the abundance of his steadfast love. For he does not willingly afflict or grieve anyone. For I think of these words from Job, Are we to receive the good at the hand of God and not receive the bad? Or again from Job, Blessed is the one whom God reproves. Therefore do not despise the affliction of the Almighty for his wounds, for he wounds but binds up, he strikes, but his hands heal. It is most certainly the hardest of all things to receive bad, 
to receive chastisement, to receive a heavy cross from the Lord. And far be it from me to say that God never gives you more than you can handle. You've heard that saying, have you not? Far be it from me to say that to you because what it is is cliche spiritualism and it has absolutely zero grounding anywhere in the scripture. Nowhere, nowhere has God ever promised to give you more than you can handle. But, but, God never gives you more than what he can handle for you. Which is to say, when you have completely fallen, when you have become completely weak, when you have absolutely no strength left, no energy, no motivation to move forward, just then, you find where God's strength kicks in. And He will not give you more than what He can handle on your behalf. So wait on the Lord. Bear patiently your cross. Keep your eyes on His cross. Keep your ear attentive to His word and to His promises. And He will bring you through and you will know joy anew, and your joy ultimately will be complete. Verses 26 and 27, On that day you will ask in my name. I do not say that you will ask the Father. I do not say that I will ask the Father on your behalf, for the Father himself loves you because you have loved me and believed that I have come from God. I love this verse. You should love it too. Jesus says that you are not going to pray to him or even through him, but you will go to the Father directly. Pass, go, collect your $200. You'll go directly to the Father because the Father himself loves you. Why does he love you? He loves you because you love the Son. He loves you because you confess the Son. He loves you because you believe in the work that He has done for you through the Son, namely, to take your sins away, to make you whole, to give you hope and newness of life. This is why the Father loves you. And He loved you still before you believed. He loved you even before you believed. While you were still dead in the trespasses of your sins, He loved you and sent His Son to die for you, Paul says. You're going to go directly to the Father because the Father himself loves you. And it's not only, it is not only the Son and the Spirit who love you, but the Father himself whom you cannot see, have never seen, and will never see until the great day. He loves you. He loves you and he wants you to speak directly to him just as children climbing up into their loving daddy's lap and talking to them. Not only do you not need to go through the saints with your prayers, you can, but you don't need to. Not only do you not need to go through the sun with your prayers, you can, but you don't need to. You can go straight to the top. You have direct access. You don't need to know a guy who knows a guy. <laughs> you know the guy. <laughs> By the ascension of our Lord, you have been given direct access to the head office, to the very throne of grace. And when you don't know what to say when you do go there, when you're so completely overwhelmed by your cares and the burdens of your heart, by the cross that you're bearing, fear not, the Holy Spirit will say the words for you. With sighs, too deep for words. In this way, all of Christian prayer is Trinitarian in nature. You go to the Father because the Son has opened the way to you, and the Holy Spirit kind of takes you by the hand and says, let's go talk to the Father now. Verses 29 to 32, his disciples said, Yeah, now you're speaking plainly, not in figures of speech. Now we know you know all things and do not have to question and not have to have anyone question you. By this we believe that you came from God. The disciples who have never gotten anything in their lives, at least as recorded in the Gospels, they never get anything. They never understand anything. And now all of a sudden they understand because this is the point at which I say, I do not understand. <laughs> this is the point at which I say, Jesus, you are speaking as 
unplainly as possible. But you disciples who have not understood anything up to this point, now you get it, huh? Okay, and Jesus turns around. This is very interesting. Jesus turns around and says, are you sure you believe? Are you sure you understand? <laughs> I would love to know what it is in these couple of chapters that Jesus said that made the disciples said, oh, I get it now. More importantly, just when the disciples think that they got it, Jesus says, hmm. Yeah, but you don't. You don't get it. You think you have it all figured out, right? You say, I don't need to go to a Bible study. I don't need to participate in small groups because I already know. I've got degrees on my wall that show me how much I know. Luther wrote a hundred volumes, over a hundred volumes worth of work, and he would be the first to tell you, I still don't have it all figured out. <laughs> right when you think you have it figured out, that's the point at which you're starting all over again. So following the resurrection of our Lord, Jesus appears to the disciples. This is after... Uh, Easter morning when he appeared to them in the upper room. He appears to them again. And where do you think he found them? He found them right where he found them the first time. Back in their fishing boats. Starting all over again. You think he got it figured out, huh? You did parochial education K-12. through <laughs> Alright. Starting all over again. Right back to square one. Verses 32 to 33, Yet Jesus says, I am not alone because the Father is with me. I have said this to you so that in me you may have peace. In the world you will face persecution. The word for persecution here can also be tri uh, translated tri uh, tribulations, trials, hard circumstances, sufferings, distress. The NRSV went with persecution the absolute highest form of hardship and distress you could possibly face, probably because the disciples themselves here are, were going to face persecution. Do you face persecution? I fa I, we don't face persecution. We really don't. We have brothers and sisters in Christ all over the world who are facing persecution. <laughs> we do not face persecution. So I think it'd be good for us to understand this as tribulations, trials, hard circumstances, sufferings, and distress. Because that's where most of us will find ourselves. Some of us may end up finding ourselves on the side of persecution. But this is more than persecution. In fact, what's interesting here is that the word for persecution here is the same word that Jesus used earlier in 16, in the middle of 16, to talk about the woman in labor. You're going to experience hardship. But Jesus says, take courage, I have conquered the world. Jesus makes two promises here to you. The first is a promise you don't want. You want, but you don't want. The first promise he makes to you is that you are going to face hard times. You are going to face the feel the weight of the world on your shoulders. You are going to be pressed so hard that you can hardly stand. Again, the word being used there is the one to describe the woman in labor. I don't know about you, but I kind of wish Jesus didn't make that promise to me. <laughs> right? Because do you want that? I should see a lot of heads shaking. No, I don't want that, Jesus. How is this promise a good promise? It's a good promise because it means that Jesus knows that you're facing these things. It's a good promise to us because it's precisely in those times that we tend to feel most abandoned by Christ, is it not? It's in those times that we often wonder the most, gee God, where are you? <laughs> the fact that he has told you you're going to face these things means that he knows about them and he has not, he has not abandoned you in them. 
He has not forgotten you when you enter such ends of life. The fact that He's promised such times to us means that He knows about them, He's aware of them, that you are not forgotten or abandoned in them. You may feel abandoned and forgotten, but you are not. Remember, Jesus promised it to you. But then He also promised you this. I have conquered the world. How is that a promise for you? Because those tribulations, those trials, those hard circumstances, the suffering and the stress that you will face have already been taken on by Christ in His own holy passion, in His own innocent suffering, in His own death. And He has overcome them. And because He has overcome them, and because by baptism you are actually in Christ, therefore you shall overcome them too. So much should you believe this, that you should already consider yourself a victor, a conqueror, in the midst of the trials and tribulations. As St. John writes in his first epistle, Little children, you are from God, and you have conquered. You have conquered. Because Christ has conquered. Because he's already gotten to the other side of the battle, the other side of the war. Therefore, you know the victory is already yours. And this morning he invites, invites you to, to the table to participate in the victory that is already his. Glory to the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. We stand and join in our song of the day, leaning on the everlasting honor. other in the world let us profess our christian faith we do so using the words of the nicene creed we believe in one god the father and the almighty maker of heaven and earth of all that is seen and unseen we believe in one lord jesus christ the only son of god eternally begotten of the father god from god light from light true god from true god begotten and made, of one being with the Father, 
Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven. By the power of the Holy Spirit, he became incarnate from the Virgin Mary and was made man. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to earth to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. Through the Father and the Son, he is worshipped and glorified. He has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins, we look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Gathered as one in Christ Jesus, let us pray for the church, the world, and for all people according to their needs. Lord God, Heavenly Father, your Son has promised that if we ask, we shall receive. Let these words ring in our ears so that we know our prayers are pleasing to you, since Christ has commanded us to pray and promised to hear us. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Lord, protect your church from complacency, anxiety over worldly things, and fear of persecution. Give us faithful pastors and church workers who proclaim your life-giving word to us. Grant us zeal for the house of God and peace in our hearts and in our days. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Gracious God, soften the hearts in every home. Turn parents and children toward each other in love and patience. Banish the spirit of impudence, stubbornness, and rebellion from all. Sanctify us in your truth. Lord, in your mercy. The eternal Lord, receive our supplications, prayers, intercessions, and thanksgivings for all civil authorities and servants in high positions. Give them the saving knowledge of Christ Jesus, our mediator, whose death is the ransom for all. Bless also their exercise of power for the common good, that we may lead peaceful and quiet lives, godly and dignified in every way. Lord, in your mercy. Compassionate God, in the resurrection of your dear Son, you showed his victory over all our griefs and sorrows having carried them to the cross, breaking their power, and winning for us life and salvation. Grant your mercy to the sick and sorrowing, the grieving and dying, especially those we lift before you now, whether out loud or in our hearts. Lord, in your mercy. Heavenly Father, you have attended to the voice of our prayers, for you have commanded us to pray and have promised to hear us. Let your mercy comfort and sustain us in prayer, that we may heartily and fervently pray to you at all times and in all places, not doubting but trusting in your promise. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Let us now prepare our hearts for the Lord's Supper. Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. The word spoken to us so long ago on the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it, gave it to his disciples, and said, Take and eat. This is my body which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Likewise, after supper he took the cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is a new testament to my blood shed for you and for all people, for the forgiveness of sin. Do this as often as you drink of it, in remembrance of me. Lord, remember us in your kingdom as you taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. 
This is the Lord's table. He calls to you saying, this is my body given for you, my blood shed for you. You will receive by intinction. This morning you receive the wafer to dip in the chalice where there is both wine and grape juice. And we will dismiss both sides together. Bread will be in the middle and we'll have two stations of wine on either side. But the table is set and the feast is prepared. Come and taste and see that the Lord is good. You may be seated.
Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And may the body of our Lord Jesus Christ and his most precious blood strengthen you and keep you into everlasting life. Amen. Amen. Our closing hymn. receive the benediction. And may the God of peace who brought back from the dead our Lord Jesus, the great shepherd of the sheep, by the blood of the eternal covenant, make you complete in every good thing, so that you may do his will, working among you that which is pleasing in his sight, through Jesus Christ, to whom be the glory forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Please be seated for two seconds. Uh, you have all the announcements that you need to know in the bulletin. Just a couple of things really quick. We do have food later and congregational meeting and all those things so please stay and hang out we did bring up the offering box it's over here on the music table uh, for those who need access to it uh also service time change yes. for next sunday starting next starting sunday next sunday second service the so second service people raise your hand because this applies to you all right 10 15 10 15 and along with that, we're going to be trying out, do a little experimenting with some education hour changes, change possibilities. So uh, 10, 15, second right. service next week. First service people, you're still at 8. <laughs> you Set go. your alarm clock. But they can come to 10, 15. They can't come to 10, 15. Or if they don't like change, they can just continue to go to 8. <laughs> Either one. Um, also, uh, the... Vacation Bible School we have coming up. We do have a uh, rotation lead and assistant meeting this Tuesday evening at 6.30, and we have Theology on Tap on Wednesday night, 6 o'clock. I think that's about it. Yeah, uh, meeting is in the Sanctuary Fellowship Hall. Sanctuary for the meeting, it starts soon and very soon. Uh, <laughs> real quick, thank you, Bill, for setting sound up and for music Keith for getting the Mevo out so we could still video the service for those who couldn't be here and also to Paul for helping with chair setup and the council for getting the lunch prepared um, thank you for coming thank you God for this beautiful morning any other thank yous that we should make 
Birthdays. Are there any birthdays? Nobody wanting to admit it because it's hot. <laughs> <laughs> anniversaries. So I guess we're not doing no. birthdays and anniversaries after well, all. Well, we did, but they're just they're nice. being quiet. All right, go in peace. Serve the Lord. Actually, stay in peace. Keep serving the Lord. <laughs> Thanks Thanks to God. God. <laughs> awesome.